If you have your Bible with you, please turn to Matthew chapter 7. There's something really important for all of us to understand. See, when, when you're studying the scripture, when you're looking at the Bible, you always need to keep in mind the bigger context of what the writer is trying to say. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is actually talking about wrong ways that, that we seem to relate with other people. A few weeks ago, we saw where Jesus says, hey, don't judge. He says, thou shalt not judge. And he warns people against condemning other people. And then last week we saw where Jesus says, hey, don't point out the speck in your brother or sister's eye when there's this great big plank in your own. He warns people against criticizing and blaming. Now this morning, listen to these amazing words from Jesus in verse 6. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, what is Jesus saying here? I asked some of our kids at Westgate what they thought that meant, what it means to, to actually say, hey, don't cast your pearls to pigs. They came up with this great stuff. Now, here are some of their responses. Emily said, I think it means to be thankful. Nora said, it means you shouldn't be selfish. Joey thinks it means to be nice before being mean. Mason said, you get rid of the good things in your life before the evil. Now, the Baird kids, they, they clued in on the word cast, so obviously it had something to do with fishing and using a pearl or something as a lure. Ethan says, putting other things before their relationship with God. His brother Parker said, it means that you're wasting your riches and talents on meaninglessness or foolish things. That's really wise. Their cousin Jacinda says, it means giving good things to the wrong people. Julie said, I don't know, to spend your money on more than pigs? Or her sister Rachel said, don't give in to evil, which is very good advice, by the way. And I love Hannah's answer in the form of a question. Um, to make a bracelet with pigs? <laughs> All very good answers, you guys. Thank you so much for your help. Don't cast your pearls to pigs. What does it mean? One boy says of his sister, hey, I would never give my sister my toys. Is that what Jesus had in mind? That my toys are my pearls and my sister is a pig? In other words, some people are unworthy pigs who you shouldn't help. Now, here's the problem with that idea. According to the Bible, who would be considered the, the sinful, the wicked, the fallen, the broken, the messed up people? Well, that would be everybody, including you and me. Now, if Jesus is the great treasure, the pearl of heaven then he should never have been cast into the middle of us, right? Because we're all the, the messed up people category. But Jesus actually said it was precisely for that reason. It was precisely for the messed up, sinful, wicked people that he came here in the first place. He said, it's not for the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, Jesus didn't teach that we shouldn't do good things for people who might reject or misuse them. In fact, he taught precisely the opposite. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good. So Jesus isn't saying here that certain classes of people are to be considered pigs or dogs that are unworthy of our great pearls. Nobody ever taught or modeled the command to love all people with the depth and clarity that Jesus did. The problem giving a pearl to a pig isn't that a pearl isn't, or isn't that a pig isn't worthy. The problem is that the pearl isn't very helpful to the pig. Few pigs wear pearls. I mean, you just don't see that very often. It's not a fashion statement for pigs. Jesus is getting to a deeper problem in a human relationship. Sometimes, the precious pearl you have and wish to give to somebody isn't actually wanted. It isn't actually helpful. So in that case, you shouldn't try to force it on somebody else. See, a pearl doesn't nourish a pig, and nourishment is what the pig is looking for. All the pig wants is to eat. It wants food. If you put a bunch of slop in a trough, you'll have a happy, healthy pig. If you keep putting pearls in their trough, you will not have a happy pig. You will have a resentful, stressed-out pig who's hungry. And you might think, you ungrateful pig, look at all the pearls you've been given. That won't help at all. 
eventually the pig's going to turn and take a bite out of you. Why? Well, because at least you're edible. The pearls aren't. It's the same with a dog. We love our little puppy, Gertie. But if we give her what is sacred to us, such as the Holy Bible, for instance, what if we took a trip to the Christian bookstore and we bought Gertie a beautiful leather-bound Bible with red lettering and everything, and we gave that to Gertie? She would do with it the only thing she knows how to do. She would sniff it and eat it. Now, there's a story of a family who purchased a big nativity scene one Christmas. They had a puppy, too. And the puppy ate a wise man, and the family put up with it. And then it ate a sheep, and the family put up with that, too. Then the puppy started to eat the baby Jesus in the manger. And that, that just kind of seemed way over the top for this family. So their command to the puppy that Christmas was, hey, stay away from Jesus. Jesus says, do not give dogs what is sacred, not because the dog is unworthy, but because it won't help the dog. And then Jesus says, hey, don't throw your pearls to pigs. He's still talking about wrong ways that people relate to others. Jesus is forbidding the practice of what we might call pearl imposing. This is when you, you try to impose your great wisdom and your will and your way and your superior intellect and knowledge where you impose your pearls onto somebody else, even when they don't want it, even when it's not being helpful. Now, if you've been through the Bible a few times, you might wonder, doesn't, you know, doesn't a pearl in the Bible always mean something of great value to Jesus? Like when he talks about the kingdom of heaven as a, a pearl of great price. Look, you need to know something about Jesus. Like he was this great communicator. And like any other great communicator, they often use images in different ways. Like one time Jesus describes the kingdom of heaven being like yeast because it's, it's like this amazing growth that's happening. And another time he says, hey, beware of the yeast of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now there, yeast was a negative thing. So Jesus is teaching here that people who impose their pearls are often more critical than they are encouraging. It's the way of the pearl imposer. Paul says this, therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. But see, that's what pearl imposers do. They're all about judging other people. They take it upon themselves to correct everybody else because they notice where other people are wrong. See, if you look for flaws, what are you going to find? You're going to find flaws. I guarantee it. If you search for faults, you're going to be successful in that. Then you're going to go through life wondering, huh, I wonder why people don't like to hang out with me. Pearl imposing is a lonely way to live. Pearl imposers tend to have a, a superiority complex. The pig generally notices all of this. By the way, pigs are pretty sensitive. They have a good radar for this. So the teaching here is if the pig isn't ready for your pearl, don't push it. Part of love is not just knowing what to say, it's knowing when to say it or when not to say it. This is from the book of Proverbs. If anyone loudly blesses their neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. In other words, the pig wants to sleep in. Let the pig sleep in. Now, the pearl might actually be good wisdom. The pearl that you want to give might actually be the gospel of Jesus itself. There's a story of a woman and she really loved Jesus and that's a good thing. And she loved her husband and she wanted her husband to love Jesus and that's a good thing. And she had this spiritual pearl that she wanted to give to him so much, but she kept trying to force that pearl on him. And she would tell him, hey, read this scriptural book. Listen to this godly podcast. Consider these seven proofs that God exists. And she would constantly remind him, I'm praying for you. Sometimes she would pray at dinner so long that her husband's food was getting cold. All the while, she was just praying, God, would you please save my husband? Have another pearl. The pig wasn't happy about this. Now, when it comes to telling other people about your faith, one of the most important things that you need to follow is this whole idea of supply and demand. In other words, observe the level of demand for spiritual conversation from the person you're talking to. Hey, if they're asking questions about God, if they're wanting to know what your story is, then adjust your level of supply on how long you can talk about spiritual things to be compared to their level of demand, what they're asking for. On the other hand, 
if the other person isn't looking at you anymore, if they're not nodding their head, if, if they stopped asking questions or they're making, they're, you know, they're not making those listening sounds anymore, like, hmm, oh, yes. <laughs> if they're leaning backward with their arms crossed, it's probably time to stop talking. You have violated this whole idea of supply and demand. Stop imposing your pearl and start watching the pig. Pearl imposing can happen in a marriage. It can happen in a workplace. It can happen at school. It can happen between friends. Guys, it can happen at a church. But you know the place where pearl imposing is most likely to happen and where most of the damage actually takes place in a relationship is between a parent and a child. When Braden was born, I was so overwhelmed with being a dad. I thought I needed to watch over every part of his life every moment. I controlled what he ate. I controlled how long he slept and what he wore and where he went and who he saw and what he heard. Because, man, I could mess him up. That's a heavy weight, you know, becoming a dad. There's only one thing harder than being in control of your child's life, and that's not being in control of your child's life. We live with pressure and expectation and worry and hopes and love and ego, and it's all churned up and mixed together. That's just the truth of, for us as parents. Blown up expectations and pressure can lead to pearl imposing. Sit up straight. Clean your room better. Get your homework done. Why aren't you more like your sister? Why can't you listen? Why don't you obey? Why do you disappoint me? Why do you make so many mistakes? Now, you may not say those questions out loud, but again, the pigs have really sensitive radar. Everybody here had parents. Question to you, how many of you really wish your parents had given you more lectures when you were growing up? Just, you know, I wish I would have gotten one more talk about dot, dot, dot. So often my kids know exactly what I'm going to say way before I even say it. Jesus' teaching here isn't saying not to confront or set boundaries he isn't saying not to enforce consequences. We all need that. It's part of our job as parents. Jesus' point is don't force your wisdom on somebody who's not receptive to it. You cannot control any other person. They have their kingdom. It's not your kingdom. You can't make sure any other person turns out right. You have to, at one point, let go and let just make space for God. God's the only one who can enter into their kingdom in a profound way, especially for those of us who love God and who are following Jesus. And I know, I know, I know what we want as parents more than anything else is for our children to know, love, and follow God as well. There's nothing more painful for a parent than to know the greatest treasure of your life is unwanted by your child. I was talking to a guy I know who had a child kind of late in his life, and he said his prayer was, God, don't give me a child unless that child will be a lifelong Christ follower. He wanted a guarantee from God himself that his child would have faith in the Lord. He's like, I don't want to have the pain of knowing to love a child who doesn't hold faith like I do. That's what he was saying, basically. I, I got to tell you, I'm not sure I'd want to be that guy's kid. I'm not sure I'd want to carry that kind of weight because God made everybody to be free to choose. God makes people free even at the cost of great pain to himself. Think about this. God, God loves us so much. He loves people so much that even when they use their God-given freedom to reject him, he lets that happen. This is why in, in a thriving church, everybody owns helping the kids who grow up in the church. They do it together. At some of the conferences that I've attended, they would talk about how there needs to be this you know, ratio between five to one, where the church will want to have a one volunteer leader for every five kids, and that's a good thing. However, people who do research on this faith development stuff say that what really needs to happen is the, that ratio needs to flip. You know, they need to grow up, these kids, having a village pouring in them. So if you're a parent, what you really want is a team of five adults who will want to nurture your one child's faith development. That team could include grandparents and aunts and uncles and volunteer ministry leaders. Maybe it includes somebody in your life group or maybe it includes a parent of one of your, your kid's friends. It's a weird thing, though, about kids. I don't fully understand this, but I've seen it firsthand. 
There actually comes a time in your kid's life where they actually don't want your pearls anymore, parents. As, as great as your pearls are, they want somebody else's pearls. There's a story of a famous Super Bowl winning NFL coach named Tony Dungy. And his son was going to high school. His son's playing on the football team and he's spending a lot of energy doing that and he's really into it. But all he would eat for breakfast was Pop-Tarts. Now I love Pop-Tarts, but they're not the most nutritious thing in the world. Tony told his son about the science of nutrition and, and training and how you know, he needed to eat bigger and better in the morning. And he said, you know, this is nothing, this Pop-Tart. You, you got to stop eating this. This is from an NFL Super Bowl winning coach. His son doesn't respond at all. One morning, Tony came downstairs and his son was fixing this great big breakfast, eggs and bacon and oatmeal and fruit. Tony was so glad his, his pearl had finally gotten through so he couldn't resist commenting to his son. And, and he said, hey, I see you're fueling up today, buddy. And his son said, yeah, my coach said I needed a bigger breakfast. His dad is a Super Bowl winning NFL rock star, but he's dad. So this pig doesn't want that pearl. That's why it takes a village to train up a child. And I just want to say, I am so grateful for every person who volunteers their time and energy and, and they volunteer their heart to love our kids, to love our students, to pour into them, to help them come to know the love of God. God loves your child more than you do. God's heart breaks over your child more than your heart breaks. So you can release your child into the hands of God. You can release it into the care of God. I say this too to all of you who are parents. You are responsible to your child, but there comes a time when you're not responsible for your child. That's a burden you can't carry. There's a recovery lesson that goes, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. This is one of the things pearl imposers have to learn. There's a story about what can happen when you stop looking with a critical eye, when you stop trying to force your pearls onto people all the time. It's actually a fictional story that was written a long time ago, and I want to tell it to you, and then I want to tell you the story that's behind the story. It's a story about a fifth grade teacher named Mrs. Thompson and a fifth grade boy that she didn't like very much. The boy's name was Teddy Stallard. Teddy didn't play well with other kids. His clothes were kind of a mess. He was just unpleasant to be around. He was kind of disruptive. He was kind of uncooperative. And it got to the point where Mrs. Thompson kind of got some pleasure in putting, putting him down. He, she would just put a lot of red ink on his papers so that he knew he was, in fact, not doing well in class. And that kind of made her feel better. It wasn't until halfway through the year when she was reviewing his files that she learned his story. See, everybody has a story. Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright child with a ready laugh. He is a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy is an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he's troubled because his mother is very ill. Life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, Teddy's mother's death has really been hard on him. He tries really hard to do his best, but his father doesn't show much, much interest in him at all. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn. He doesn't show much interest in school at all. And by now, Mrs. Thompson realized the problem and she, she's so ashamed of herself and her actions, she felt even worse when her students brought her Christmas presents wrapped in beautiful ribbons and bright shiny paper except for Teddy's. Teddy brought her a present, but it was clumsily wrapped in this heavy brown paper he got from an old grocery bag. Mrs. Thompson, she was quite careful to open it in the middle of all the other presents the kids had brought. And some of the kids, they started to laugh when she found out that, you know, when she opened up the present, it was like this rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing. And, and he got her a, a bottle that was about a quarter full with this cheap perfume in it. And she stopped the other kid's laughter and she exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was. And she put it on and then she dabbed some of the perfume on her neck and on her wrist. 
And Teddy, Teddy Stallard, he stayed after school that day just long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, today you smell just like my mom used to. And that, that bracelet looked really pretty on your wrist. Now, after the children left, she, she cried for a half an hour. And on that day, she quit teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. And she began, well, she began to teach children that day. And Mrs. Thompson, she, she paid particular attention to Teddy from that time on. And as she worked with him, as she saw something good in him, his mind seemed to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the more she believed in him, the faster he seemed to respond. And by the end of the year, Teddy had become one of the smartest kids in the class. Six years later, she gets this note from Teddy. He then wrote and had, had finished high school and and he, was, he had second in his class. And four years after that, she got another letter saying that while things had been tough at times, that he would soon graduate from college with highest honors. Four years later, four years passed, and eventually another letter came. And this time, <clears throat> the letter was signed, Theodore F. Stallard, M.D. And he told her he'd met a girl. And he told her that he was getting married and he asked her if she would just please come and sit in the place of the mother of the, of the groom. He wanted her to sit right there, and she did. And she wore the old bracelet, and she wore the perfume that he gave her. And when he thanked her for being the best teacher he ever had, she told him he had it all wrong. He was the one who taught her. That story, that story was written by a woman named Elizabeth Ballard, and she said it, it was triggered by two real-life events— the first was a time when she'd been teaching Sunday school because she's a follower of Jesus, the one who said, don't cast your pearls before pigs. And she was teaching and a grubby little boy had given her a rhinestone bracelet and a bottle of cheap perfume. And that moment reminded her of when she was a little girl and when she grew up in a family that was really poor and she had no money and she brought her teacher a gift of pecans from a tree in her backyard. It's all she could give. All the other kids started to laugh. Her teacher stopped them. Her teacher saved her by saying that she was going to make this fruitcake. And this was just what she needed to make the fruitcake. I think the reason the story has touched so many people is we forget every day we will choose the eyes we use to see people. Either eyes of judgment or eyes of love. I don't know about you, but I think... This world is kind of tired of Christians trying to force their pearls on other people. I don't think it's our job to try to go around correcting people and fixing people and giving advice to people who aren't asking for it and explaining everything to everyone and how this group is wrong and how there's a problem with that group of people. And we don't, you know, we don't need to be this way. You know, we don't need to say, why don't these people behave like we think they should? I think it's time for followers of Jesus to come alongside other people and offer hope and offer healing and offer some humility, some servanthood, some generosity and love. That's how Jesus created us to be. That's how Jesus created what became the most inviting movement in the history of humanity. Now, in this Jesus, no more divisions. The dividing wall is torn down. There's no more separating Jew and Gentile or slave or free or male and female. This week, no pearl imposing, no judging, no condemning, no superiority, no comparing, no blaming. Just remember that story about Teddy. And as you go on with your day today, ask God this question. God, would you help me to see what you see when you look at that person? Would you help me to think what you think and feel what you feel and say what you say? And then a little bit of his kingdom will come from up there down here through you and flow into them. Let's pray. God, we are blessed to be in your family and Lord, we thank you so much that we can come together, even in this way, to be able to just share with one another how much you love us. God, we, we just want to strive and be people that, that please you and love you because we, we want to honor you by what you say. Forgive us for, for imposing our thoughts and our wisdom on other people when it's so not wanted. 
God, help us to be wise and, and discerning and being able to, to read the people that we are talking to to see if they are receptive to what we want to say and what you want us to say to them. God, we want to make a difference in our community. Lord, we lift up Spokane. We lift up Washington. We lift up the United States. We lift up the entire planet, Lord. And we pray for healing physically and most importantly, spiritually as we draw to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.